you know, this time of year is is usually when we prepare for the almond bloom. The almond bloom uh, lasts several weeks out of the year. It comes pretty fast, lasts a little while and leaves. The earlier varieties mature any day now. Uh, we're getting our, our bees prepared and in place so that we're prepared for the almond bloom. What I love most about farming is it's a family affair. My grandparents farmed, multiple generations before me farmed, my parents farm, my brother farms, and when we get together, we talk about farming. And it's easy, we talk about farming all the time to the point, point where our spouses are like, can you guys stop talking about farming? I like working out here in ag because, I mean, look at nice spring morning, this is your office. Things change throughout the season out here, so nothing is the same constantly. It takes a certain type of person to, to, to be an ag, I believe. So urbanists have kind of lost that connection back to the farm. They're not the ones in the barns milking the cows twice a day. They're not in the barns raising the cattle to understand the blood, sweat, and tears that go into it. My path through agriculture and getting to where I am, I and mean, a lot of people don't know, but my parents weren't farmers. I had no, no, no way of having a, an opportunity to farm. And here I am, here in a, you know, 80 acres of alfalfa that I farm and have a small business, but getting here was quite the journey. It's interesting to talk to people we go to the World Ag Expo every year and we have a booth and we get to meet a lot of the people that we talk to on Facebook and you're able to put a face with a name and you chat with someone for 15 minutes and you find out that you know we're not just talking to ourselves and people are listening and people are, are gaining a larger understanding of, of how things work in agriculture. Farmers today are much higher level than they were in the 50s. They're more efficient with their water, they're high tech, uh, they pay and treat their workers better, they're less wasteful, and they do a much better job of producing food. Farmers love what they do, and I understand a lot of corporations do also, I respect that, but farmers, family farmers make up 90% of, of agriculture in the, in the United States. And I want to continue to see farmers, family farmers thrive. Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, helping to protect and grow Valley Agribusiness in California for over 40 years by the Gar and Esther Tatillion Charitable Foundation, a legacy of giving to support the people that make agriculture grow. Farms feed families, public television feeds minds. By Brandt, professional agriculture, supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural central California, keeping Valley agriculture connected since 2003. By Harris Farms, a tradition of working forward to protect the future of water, ranches, and farms in California and beyond. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for a half century, dedicated to supporting Valley agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food. So we're here in Madera, California, Madera County, and we, we settled uh, south of Madera in this beautiful fertile soil of Madera County. Uh, our, our family story started way back when, in fact, we have a, I have an aunt who's a family historian and she can date us back as the early 1700s. And what's special about our family is a family member since then has always farmed. 
Elvin, also known as E.K. Davis, is my grandfather. He's known in the community as E.K. Davis. Uh, he married my grandmother named Betty. They met in high school. They eventually eloped in Las Vegas and got married. And then they moved back to this Madera area and began farming. In fact, uh, my grandparents have passed, but they uh, settled in this area, which is the house about a half mile there. So my, my grandparents lived a half mile there. My parents lived a half mile there, and we live right between them all, which is, which is pretty, pretty cool as a family business. You can all li live together in the same area. It's nice for babysitting duties, that's for sure. Uh, they got into dairy when they first started farming. Uh, big dairyman, they dairied for 46 years. He was very supportive of the dairy industry. He was a part of Danish Creamery Board for, for 20 plus years, which is a big community support uh, involvement, I believe. Uh, dairy, so they started dairy in 1945. They, they started by accident, like typ typical farmer, I think, uh, most of the time. They bought some dairy heifers that began to calve, and then they had calves to deal in, in milk and then they bought a bull, and then before you know it, they were farming, I think, dairying about 400 head or so of cattle. And that's a business that I'm not too familiar with because that was before me, my time, but my dad is very familiar with that operation. And so he, uh, growing up in the dairy industry, I'm not a dairyman. I think those guys are the hardest farmers, hardest working farmers around, hands down. But my, my dad decided, I don't know if I wanna go into dairy. And they had to milk, they had to milk uh, twice a day, and it was a very demanding uh, career in agriculture. Just trying to make ends meet with the family back in the day, we would grow some corn silage for local dairymen, and we spent a lot of summers with my family. My brothers and I would spend a lot of time farming that corn silage with my dad, and we would flood irrigate. We would build the ditch that would that would uh, run around the, the property, would fill the ditch up with water and then we'd, ha we'd run like hell to siphon pipe and get the water to a level to where you don't break the ditch. And so once we got that done, then we played. And so we would get down to our whitey tidies and we would, we would run up and down the ditch bank and just, it, it's kind of weird now talking about it. Like, it's like, why would you do that? But man, you can't beat those. Those are some good memories. Funny now, but those are the experiences that you have out here. Folks that lived in the city would play and they would go skateboarding and they would have sleepovers. And even though we did some of that, we just, we didn't do as much as probably others. We, st we were up on Saturday morning, working after breakfast on Sunday. And that was kind of the name of the game. Wine grapes break dormancy about a month after almonds do. I always say almonds break dormancy or start, start blooming around uh, February 15th or, or Valentine's Day. These wine grapes are about a month after that. But it really depends on the season, depends on how cool the weather was in, in the wintertime. So from the time that these wine grapes break dormancy and bloom and harvest, I mean, it's just, you better hope you have all your equipment ready to go because it happens so fast. This block here is our Syrah block. It's been here for quite a few years. And we, we, crazy, we prune it what we call crazy prune. There's not a whole lot of structure to it, as you can see. So fruit, uh, wine grapes come from one-year-old wood. So here's an example of one-year-old wood. This is, a, this is a single, this is a year old. Well, below it is two years old and three years old. And so you can trace back to how old this vine is. Now, not right here can you tell how old this vine is, but what's neat about this is, if you look at this shoot tip, this is one year old, that piece is two years old, below it is three years old, maybe four, five, six, maybe seven, eight, and it just keeps going. But the, so, wine, but the grape only comes from the one year old? One year old wood. So next year, this bud will produce a shoot that'll, that'll bear fruit and then the cycle just continues. We were poor. When, when, my, when we were growing up, we were pretty poor. A lot of, lot of, lot of friends and family didn't even realize just, just how poor we were. Um, we didn't even could afford milk. We drank powdered milk um, and at one point 
we were nearly homeless and we had to move into my dad's uh, parents' house. And I was the oldest kid and so I realized, I, was, I understood we had, more so than my brother and sister, that we were in a pretty tough spot. My mom and dad never took any government assistance and they carried two or three jobs. My dad had a, if he had a job, he was doing landscaping on the weekend. Mom, and both my father and, and my mom would uh, uh, clean office buildings on the weekend as well. And so we would mow our church building's lawn for 50 bucks a month. And so for me, there was, I didn't have to worry about, I, since watching my father do that to, to, to provide for us, I did the jobs that people say someone like me won't do. I, you know, I irrigated with siphon pipes in 105 degree weather. I did the jobs that they say that we, that, that someone like me won't do. I did them for 10 years. And so because of that experience, that, and, and then having firsthand relationships with field workers from other countries, working side by side and, and, and having this um, just tremendous amount of respect for those people working with me, um, I wouldn't change anything. The way, how I ended up here, and it's a beautiful story because my, my dad ended up being highly educated, my mother too, my brother and sister. I, however, love the fields and didn't get educated, but I have a tremendous education that this, this industry has given me uh, nonetheless. I never understood why agriculture has to be in a left and right argument. I mean, we all want to eat, right? And eating, and I want people to um, eat three times a day. I want nutritious, you know, healthy, clean, abundant food supply for our people. It's, and and they're, they're, unfortunately, we have 330 million people live here, which it takes an enormous amount of food to feed people three times a day. If anybody's ever tried to put on a wedding party and planning that, you realize, what it takes just to feed 200 people for one evening. It's a massive undertaking, right? Um, and so when you start to think about all the things that are needed and, and involved, you know, eating is something we can all agree on. And we get a starting point with food, right? There's a lot of foodies out there. And I think that the people in the, on the, uh, that, that are outside agriculture may be more, you know, have environmental concerns, they eat too. And um, um, I think we, at least we can start there, right? You know, my dad used to have a saying that uh, a farmer is a unique individual. Uh, you can put a $100 bill in his pocket, walk him out into the middle of 160 acres, drive a stake in the ground, put a chain around his ankle and around that stake, and that that farmer will actually chew his foot off and crawl to town to spend that $100. And his point was, all of the economic activity that you see out here in the west side, and it's billions of dollars, there is only one place the farmer can spend that money, and that's in town. And so people who are urban and who have businesses in town, whether it's a grocery store, an auto dealership, a movie theater, a fast food restaurant, uh, you know, line it up, uh, benefit from those dollars that are generated out here in the countryside, but there's only one place it can be spent, and that's in town. So I think we sometimes feel like there's a lack of appreciation of the importance that agriculture has for the economic activity. They talk about, oh, it's 2% of the estate's economy or 4%, whatever the number. It's a heck of a lot more than that. Uh, more recently, when we began having these drought periods where land was being fallowed, uh, I try to talk to some of my urban friends and say, you know, you all ought to be more engaged in this issue because while it may not sound like much when 150,000 acres of land is lying fallow in the Westlands Water District, that 150,000 acres uh, would generate on an annual basis about three to four thousand dollars per acre. And if you take that and multiply it by three and a half times through the economy, those are dollars that never get spent. And spent where? Spent in town. This is my family's, one of my family's first purchases when they got into farming in 1977 together. This is a 320 acres of, of, of all wine grapes. And it's been wheat, alfalfa in the past. It's even been a dairy in the past. But now it's, it's all wine grapes. And I'm going to show you a little bit uh, the ranch, you can see it's like your typical, I think, 
I don't want to say old school farmer, but farmers don't let anything go. I think farming is so difficult for in the early years of, of when a farmer starts their business. They just ha everything is ex everything is uh, difficult, so they just keep all their equipment over the over time. And so it's I don't want to call it a junkyard, but there's a lot of cool stuff out here. Uh, I always tell my dad like, Dad, we gotta get rid of some. He's like. But who am I to say that? Like, Dad, yeah, let's let's get rid of the stuff. And I didn't start the I didn't start the business that he did. And I think if I did, I'd probably keep the same. I'd keep the stuff too, right? I mean, it's, to me, it's junk. But to him, it represents how he started and what it took to kind of get going. <laughs> You know, grow, growing up in the family business, we learned quickly that this is a part of our life and this is what we, we talk about at dinner table and, and on the phone and this is what we do and we love doing this. I never thought about doing anything other than farming and if someone were to ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'd say, well, I don't want to be an astronaut. I don't want to be a scientist. I mean, I just love farming. Can I just do that? I read an article the other day that says, that says people love farmers, but they don't like agriculture. And that blows me away because I'm thinking farmers are agriculture. And so when they say they don't like agriculture, you get defensive and say, well, you don't like me. You know, we are sustainable. We, the only way we survive is being sustainable. We have to make a, a profit of something so we can farm the next year. And it's very difficult to do that. And there's so much regulation uh, in front of us and it's it's shaped where we are today and we have to deal with that as it comes on but really what we want to do is just farm we just want to spend time and hours in the field caring for the plants in the ground and do it in this very sustainable way so family farms how do we keep them going well it's been very tough because uh, you know a lot of farmers are getting up close to my age and they're getting to the they are already to or past the point where they should be passing the farm to the next generation. And uh, in a lot of cases, the next generation doesn't want to do it. They see all, all the, the hardship and, and the risks that their fathers have gone through and they say, I don't want to do that. Let's just sell the farm and go somewhere else. They sell to investors. All right, so say my neighbor sells his, his farm and he says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sell my farm and move to Idaho. Well, if I wanna buy it, there's more likely a group of investors that have more money than me that'll buy it, okay? I, can, I only buy something that I can know that will pay for itself. An investor doesn't look, for it, look at it that way. They look at what is it, what's the investment to buy and then when we sell, we wanna sell for a profit and they're gone. And they can be here for a couple of years or, or, or five years but sooner or later, they're gonna find a, a better investment and they're gonna drop it and go. I'm trying to pass my farm on to the next generation. This is a really, a, truly a family operation. My wife works with me. She, she manages those 300 people that are out there harvesting the crops. She's there right now. Have a daughter that works with me um, in food safety. Have a, a son-in-law that's married to another daughter and he's managing the farm. We think that we're, we're good to pass it on to the next generation, but we don't know because we don't know what the government's gonna do. Farming found me, I think, is what, how it really happened. I knew I wanted to work outdoors, uh, didn't wanna be in an office, and uh, got involved in agriculture, and it led to, uh, to being able to farm, uh, to manage a large farm, and also farm uh, on my own. Uh, I just have loved producing food to feed people, uh, healthy products, uh, and, and really take pride in, in what we do here in the San Joaquin Valley. I mean, we live in such a very rich area here as far as the food, the variety of uh, crops that we grow here. Uh, when I see our, uh, our crops going to the market to, uh, to end up in a store or in a product, it, it just gives me a lot of pride. I mean, I've done the math and uh, several years ago and uh, for the calories that we grow here, and I know we feed at least 100,000 people a meal every day. We know that we, uh, we're an integral part of the food system and food security 
for, uh, for California and the nation. They're sweet, they're really good. I, you know, I think ultimately we can, we can stand on the moral high ground and say that people need to learn about agriculture. I think it's a fair argument to make that agriculture also needs to learn about the urban population and what their concerns are, what their needs are, and how do we find shared values that we can put together so we understand them and they understand us. So there is a great disconnect between urban people and agriculture. Most urban cities like Merced and many others really don't understand where their food comes from. They simply think they go to the grocery store and buy a gallon of milk, when in fact that gallon of milk took several man hours to develop. It had to start from a calf fully grow into a cow, where then a cattleman had to milk it with a milking machine or even by hand. And then he sold it to make a living. So people don't really understand the time, effort, and money that goes into the items they eat every day. Please. And I think one of the great things that agriculture are doing, agriculturists are doing, they're telling their story. And there are some great agriculturists doing that. Five Mary's Farms up there in Fort Jones, she walks people through her day in, day out life on a beef ranch. And then she makes sure that people across the United States can get her product because people want to understand who the farmer is behind that label. And so I love that connection that we're starting to make. They want to shake the hand of their farmer. And I think that's why people are buying at the farmer's markets. That's why they want to see the personal story on the hamburger. They want to know where their food's coming from because people deserve to know that. Just because you're four generations removed from it doesn't mean you don't care about what's in your food. They just simply aren't out on the farms to understand it. My goal is this is going to be a this will be a generational thing. We have to continue this march for 15, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, we can't stop the education of of our friends who enjoy our products. I don't know, I'm not an expert on this, but I would think that everybody was a farmer back in the day, right? I mean, farming back in the day was, you lived in a village, your neighbor was a chicken farmer. You know, he grew chickens, corn, wheat and for their family, but then realized, hey, neighbor, you grow this better, so you grow the potatoes and then I'll grow the wheat. And then from there, it just sort of expanded to where we are today. So I, th I think where we are today is we're just doing the best we can to provide food to the community and do it in a very sustainable way and look, be looked at in a favorable light. There's one way, which may not be realistic, but there's one way that we can get people to appreciate farmers, and that's for them to, to start a garden in their backyard. And it sounds a little pathetic, right? Like, oh, I can, I can grow a tomato plant, or you know, I can plant peppers, what's wrong with that? It's easy, right? But when you think about where are you geographically? Where are you geographically? What, what can you plant? What is your soil type? What, what type of plants am I gonna put in the ground? Do I want peppers, tomatoes? Do I need a trellis? When, what day of the year do I plant them? How long do they grow? How do I protect them from insects or fun, fungus or disease? Am I gonna make them organic or am I gonna apply, apply a product on them? How do we get them to think about what kind of water do, how much water do I put on my plants? Do they, do they need water? Are they gonna burn up in, the, in July? And then once you get a crop, once you go through the process of keeping your plants alive and having a favorable yield, now you gotta harvest it. How are you gonna harvest it? Are you gonna harvest it by hand? Do you have special tools? How much do you have? How much fruit do you have? Where are you, you going to store it? Are you going to trade it with your neighbors? Are you going to make all your, you know, 50 pounds of tomatoes into tomato sauce? Or what are you going to do with it? How are you going to how, how are you going to manage your garden? And so if I if if I if there's one thing I tell people is plant a garden because you'll realize it is so difficult to get a crop from a seedling to a harvestable product that is can make a dollar doing it, that is the most difficult thing to do. But if you could do, if you do that, you'll appreciate a farmer.
Production funding for American Grown, My Job Depends on Ag, provided by James G. Parker Insurance Associates, helping to protect and grow Valley Agribusiness in California for over 40 years. By the Gar and Esther Tatillion Charitable Foundation, a legacy of giving to support the people that make agriculture grow. Farms feed families, public television feeds minds. By Brent, professional agriculture supporting the heroes that work hard to feed a hungry world every day. By Unwired Broadband, today's internet for rural Central California, keeping Valley agriculture connected since 2003. By Harris Farms, a tradition of working forward to protect the future of water, ranches, and farms in California and beyond. And by Valley Air Conditioning and Repair, family owned for a half century dedicated to supporting Valley agriculture and the families that grow our nation's food.